All right, all right, all right. Welcome, folks. Welcome. This is the Ujima Hour. We are li broadcasting live here at the Ujima Hour. Uh, this is the Cold Nut Collaborative and Co-op for Live, and you know um, all things uh, Black Social and Solidarity Economy. This is an exploration of the Black Social and Sol Solidarity Economy through intimate and formal conversation. Uh, we are here um, in a moment. Um, we are in a moment where things that did not seem possible are now possible. Uh, we are here in a, in a moment where things that um, just last year um, we could not have imagined uh, would be coming to pass are coming to pass. Um, we are here when people are showing up for one another. Um, people are in, in, our, in our communities, um, people here in Chicago, people here on the South and West sides um, are uh, recognizing um, the layers of solidarity, the layers of intersection, the layers of connection between them. Uh, mutualism is um, rising. Um, and, you know, um, the responsibility of the Colonet Collaborative, the responsibility of spaces like Cooperation for Liberation, the responsibility of um, this, this uh, portal, the Ujima Awa, is to make sure that uh, that solidarity, that mutualism, um, all of those tendencies continue to rise. Um, the responsibility in this moment um, where we are seeing things that were impossible come to pass is for us to extend that moment forward, um, to ex expand um, the possibility that people see beyond this moment, beyond the crisis, um, and to continue to dig into uh, the work that's happening um, on the ground in our communities and, um, and make connections, make intersections between that work. Uh, so last month, um, if you were here with us, you saw that we had um, Allende Jean Baptiste on the, the line with us. And um, he was speaking about the program Drum Language, right? And he was, he was speaking about some projects that he's working on that are examining uh, language and culture and, and, and how that connects to memory and rhythm. Uh, and how does that actually connect to a vision of a new economy? How does that connect to the social and solidarity economy? Um, when we are talking about digging back into our history and, and extracting um, or, or, or excavating rather uh, practices and, 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 and spaces um, that were part of our, our place-based building, our, our place-based indigeneity, um, we need to understand you know, what that means around language, what that means around culture, uh, what that means about trying to figure out the cultures where we come from and then how that relates to the cultures that we are creating in the current moment, right? Uh, and so that's what we are here doing on the Ujima Awa. I am Michael Tekken-Strode, uh, founder and coordinator of the Colonut Collaborative, uh, co-facilitator of Co Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group. The Colonut Collaborative is Chicago's only time-based uh, service and skills exchange, uh, otherwise known as a time bank. And uh, what we do is we engage with communities and we get them to to um, ask the questions about what are the skills, what are the, 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 the services, what are the assets that, that people have um, within themselves inside of our community? How do they connect with the needs that exist in communities? And then how can we use a time bank as a framework in which those exchanges can happen and which people can make those connections? So one of the things that I've been doing lately is uh, co-facilitating um, these offers and needs markets. And an offers and needs market is simply a, a, a container, a facilitated container, a meeting, you know, where people gather together right now virtually and they begin to talk about what things they have to offer. So one of the things I frequently offer because I love fermentation, I love sauerkraut and kefir and kombucha. Um, I, I know how to do a fair amount of pickling. I've got some dehydration skills in me now. Um, these are things that I can offer to other folks. I can, I can offer to share time with you teaching you how to do dehydration, teaching you how to do fermentation or pickling. Um, these are skills that I have to share uh, in, in, in place and with members of my community. And so inside of a time bank, I would be offering that skill to someone in the time bank. And in turn, they would pay me in hours. Effectively, the hour or two hours of time that I spend with them would be banked inside of that time bank. And then I can use that time and trade it with someone else on the time bank, right? Uh, for something that I need. So particularly, with my um, Lifeboats Permaculture Guild folks, I've been putting out a, a request that I've got some drainage issues in my backyard. Uh, uh, presently, I've had a, a, a garage uh, built, in, built out back and um, it's exposed some, some major drainage issues um, 
where there's some some layers of concrete that are remaining that you know weren't weren't dug up and you know and, and there's also clay soil here and so um talking to my folks in the life Holds permaculture guild I, I wanted to know like you know is there someone who can help me solve those drainage issues and possibly redirect that uh water over to the garden beds um so that's an example of a of a sort of reciprocity inside of the time bank um that you know uh, fits differently in a moment like this right um the time bank has been going on since 2017 and it's been a challenge to really get people to understand the need for such an infrastructure right um the you know what is the value of putting these skills and these services and these needs inside of an infrastructure so that people can find them um well in a moment not like now when you cannot leave your community right in a moment uh like now where it's it's sort of a challenge to figure out where things are and in, and in, you know, and then that moment is extended, you know, by the um, closure of stores. Um, that's when you really figure out, you know, that you have to make those intersections, make those connections with people inside of your community, and um, and 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 begin to restructure how you think about community, how you think about connection, how you think about family, right? Um, and 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 for me. Um, this practice of, of, of constructing this time bank is really rooted in, in, in my work, as I've mentioned before, uh, with Black Oak Center for Sustainable Renewable Living and Healthy Food Hub. And um, we were, while we were a space that was attempting to construct a food access pipeline um, from Pembroke Township to Chicago and really just addressing that production, aggregation and distribution of food, um, more so than that, we were trying to get people to really think about um, how we are democratizing access to all of the things, all of the resources in our community, uh, because that's the sort of ultimate community resiliency. Um, as Baba Fred of Black Oak Center often says, uh, ain't no poverty in nature. Um, and so, you know, there's nowhere in nature where, you know, um, you, uh, you, you hoard nitrogen and try to figure out, you know, what's the best way to kind of, you know, um, earn some money distributing nitrogen. Um, the ecosystem uh, has, you know, ha has all sorts of, of ways that it, it goes about distributing resources, but no one th really thinks about hoarding those resources inside of nature. So, you know, the lamb's quarters, um, they might be taking up space in the garden bed, but, you know, they, they're, they're probably not consuming many more resources than the, the spinach. Um, and so, you know, um, as I've been doing my gardening lately, I've been letting the lamb's quarters um, grow, you know, that's... Um, and because they are inedible, they are an edible weed. Um, pro tip, uh, let the lamb's quarters grow. And if you don't know what a lamb's quarter is, um, hit me up on the time bank or hit me up by, uh, by in, in the message box and I'll make sure that you have a photo of it and you can kind of identify it. Um, so that, that's where the Colonel Collaborative is. Uh, with Cooperation for Liberation, um, we are currently in a space where we have continued to have our virtual bi-weekly Sunday gatherings uh, to ensure that folks have um, a space where they can learn about uh, cooperative structures. Uh, specifically, we are interested in worker-owned cooperatives. Uh, I am personally interested in a broad range of other cooperative structures and collaborative structures because ultimately uh, what I see on the other side of this, uh, you know, uh, post-COVID, post-uprising uh, world is that, you know, we have all sorts of these other ways that we are thinking about how we structure ownership of, of, of assets in our community. And none of that really resides in sort of individual hands, right? You know, there, there's a sort of a, a collective aesthetic to how we approach all of these these things. Um, so it's a sort of re you know, of our community. Um, and, you know, and, and, and you, you, you wouldn't have uh, perhaps um, the ways that we think about um, resources and assets in our community now. So I, I know that when there, when there was a, a sort of wave of rebuilding stores, there were various debates that were happening where folks were like, well, yeah, you know, why are we rebuilding private assets? You know, why are we, why are we you, know, you know, don't they have insurance? And, you know, the challenge is people feel, um, feel that divestment, right? They, they feel that, you know, that, that these resources are not part of their, their, their stock of assets, it's not part of their community, right? And so ultimately cooperation for liberation uh, both in terms of worker-owned cooperatives, you know, um, housing cooperatives, just a, a variety of cooperative infrastructure is really thinking about how we can make sure that um, we collectively have access to the assets, the resources um, in our community, um, and, and ultimately, you know, with worker-owned cooperatives, how we have access and, 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 and ownership over the sort of our time and our labor. Uh, so that's what's, uh, what's been happening with Cooperation for Liberation. Uh, we are advancing at this point towards our development timeline 
Um, so that's some things that are happening internally. Uh, and, you know, if you are looking to check in with uh, Cooperation for Liberation, I'll do a, another plug, you know, later in the segment. But um, we'll, we'll be meeting again uh, Sunday from three to six um, and, and ultimately, you know, just trying to figure out how we uh, just do some study on these cooperative structures and on these principles and on these practices, uh, ultimately so that we can we can use the point. You know, the point is to make sure that we have access to these resources so that we can use them uh, to uh, to our benefit, to our, our self-determination. And so um, that's the Cola Nut Collaborative. That's uh, Co-op for Lib. And the other thing that I, I, I'd mentioned that I would be telling you all on the recap was about my experience recently with uh, the Giving Project. Um, this is a Crossroads Funds uh, participatory giving uh, program or participatory philanthropy, you know, program. So oftentimes in philanthropy, you know, it's it's uh, yeah, a, a back room or boardroom or you know just a, a panel of people that you may not know, you may not ever see. Uh, who are making decisions about what's funded, and those folks may not have any relationship with the 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 sort of the social movement infrastructure or with the folks who are, are are scheduled to receive that funding, right? And so they don't have a lens to understand how difficult some of that work is, or or, or what what's the what's the sort of critical nature of the funding that that is distributed. Um, so Crossroads Fund um, does this giving project each year where they bring in a, a cohort that um, learn together and study together. You know, um, there's a, a, a race and class component um, where, you know, th those types of studies uh, are, are going on. Um, you know, and there's a there's a, 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 a philanthropic or giving, you know, component where we where we talk about, you know, um, how we're going to divvy up, you know, what's what the, the dollars that come in. And then there's, of course, the fundraising component, because, you know, part of this is is really just um, the, the giving project cohort participating in this process of raising funds for projects they care about and and perhaps having another lens at the end on on, on philanthropy you know because certainly I came in as a philanthropic skeptic I, I, I don't really like philanthropy I don't really care for foundations um, I, I know a lot of people at foundations and you know and and, and they they're cool um, some of them um, but I I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a skeptic of, of all things philanthropy and so going into the giving project and participating in this process um, gave me another lens in terms of um, how to approach philanthropy and also uh, really, you know, rooted me in, in the notion that um, that it's just to demand money. <laughs> it's just to demand that they redirect the resources. Right. So it's just to demand that, you know, when you when you uh, are, are, are rooted and invested in, and value the work that's happening on the ground. Um, and you go to someone who has resources that can benefit that project, um, then it's just that you should uh, say to that person, you should give resources, you need to give resources, the resources that you have to this endeavor, because this is the work that's go that matters, right? This is the work that matters for our, our, our collective liberation, our, our whole future, right? And so um, that's been my experience with the Giving Project. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's been a beneficial endeavor. It's, it's, transformed you know my my thoughts and my approach around philanthropy and around foundations um you know i'll still be a skeptic right um because there are other reasons you know that i'm skeptical about philanthropy and um you know what happens when the streets are awash with foundation dollars and some of the challenging um dynamics that happen when people are not collaborating around the right set of principles but that's a whole other discussion um that is to be had uh so you know Beyond that, um, I just wanted to kind of kind of give a frame to what's happening with the Cola Nut, what's happening with Co-op for Lib, um, and you know certainly my experience with Crossroads, and and hopefully on the other side of um, you know all of what's happening. Uh, again, we have a, a an approach to how we build community, to how we connect, to how we collaborate um, that is that expands what we think about, what we think of as the economy, right? The economy is not what we can buy and sell. Uh, the economy is how we meet needs. It's how we address the needs of, of, of folks in our community. Um, and it's how, how resources are moved to address those needs, right? Um, so, so, so we need to really be thinking about the ways that we participate in structuring an economy. And that we're able to, um, you know, ultimately, um, develop that economy, right? You know, to 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 really um, again, you know, be actors and advocates in in a, in building a just economy. 
and and that's um, that's that's what we're on the line to discuss this evening, right? Um, we are on the line to discuss Brave Space Alliance, and um, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, this is uh, someone that that I, I, I've I've had um, association with through um, a sort of network of of you know of common common colleagues and common friends. Um, but you know, it, it's good to really be in deeper conversation. Um, I always learn something new uh, in the context of these conversations on the Ujima Hour, um, and and I really hope that um, that there are some valuable things that come out um, inside of this conversation that really you know shift again how we are thinking about the economy and how we are thinking about how we build more just economies um, and more just communities, a, a, a more just world. Um, so. That's what I'm looking forward to having happen uh, on this call this evening. Um, and yeah, I want to bring in our guest, you know, um, who is Lasaya Wade, Brave Space Alliance, um, Afro Puerto Rican indigenous trans woman, founder of uh, the TNTJ Tennessee Trans Journey Project, um, and member of the Chicago Transgender Nonconforming Collective, Trans Liberation Collective, director of Brave Space Alliance, um, was recently honored uh, by the Chicago LGBTQ a, a Black History Recognition um, ceremony, and is uh, and is the first um, trans woman in Illinois history to be honored in uh, Women's History Month for work she's doing that's not limited to community organizing. So you know this is uh, uh, someone that that really sort of has a, a, a broad spectrum of, um, of 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 assets and skills and and, and talents. Um, and, and this is someone who has been doing critical work that's been covered recently by Windy City Times, Chicago Tribune, Block Club Chicago, uh, with Brave Space Alliance, which um, initiated its uh, mutual aid initiatives, um, you know, before COVID-19 uh, kicked off and, and, and really has been providing uh, what I see as a, a critical infrastructure um, for movement work that's happening in Chicago. And, and, and you know, one of the things that, um, that I've been sharing with, you know, um, some folks at a new economy coalition and on some other um, strategy calls that I've been on is is really um, when we look at places like Boston, where the Center for Economic Democracy and Boston Redeemer Humor Project are, or places like Sol Sol uh, like St. Louis and Solidarity Economy St. Louis and the St. Louis Mutual Aid Fund, um, the the ability to rapidly respond to a, a, tr a changing uh, environment, a changing terrain, is having that infrastructure in place. Um, and so that that's certainly been one of the things that I've been sharing, you know, with uh, with folks that I'm, I'm working with, just how we make sure that we have these different types of infrastructure in place uh, so that, you know, when the when when the seas change, when the weather changes, um, we have the ability to respond. We have the ability to uh, do more than just react. Um, but we, we have uh, that agility to catch our people. Right. That's what we want to do. We want to catch our people. And so I am going to uh, bring Lasaya Wade uh, onto the line uh, to share with us how we can catch our people. Lasaya, welcome to the Ujima Hour. Hello. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, I read a bio and, and I, I know that, you know, bios don't catch all of the color that, you know, is us. So, you know, I want you to tell us your story in your words. Um, give us a lens on who you are, you know, in as, as brief or as, as, as lengthy as you, you wish to, to offer. I am your intelligent ratchet hood chick. I am Nicki Minaj, Cardi B, and all them in between. I am. I can be classy, bougie, and all that, and 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 all the wonders of a black woman. Right? Uh, we have to understand that we 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 can hold all these particular intersections in one body, but also understand that we can push liberation as well. Um, and also the language. I am that. I am, I love how Shaka Khan put it, I am every woman. <laughs> yes, yes. And um, what's the journey to get there? It was hard. Um, my life was not easy. It was, it was, it was difficult. Um, I'm glad the world is changing from what it was to what it is now, and it and it's getting better as the days go by. I hope. Um, but 
um, I was raised in a household with stern parents that loved me, cared for me, but also did not know who I was. Um, so there was a lot of bickering, fussing, fighting. Um, but there was a lot of uh, dra- drug uh, drug addiction in my household as well. And I had to raise my sisters on my own um, also. So it, w- it was including that I learned how to hustle at a young age. I learned how to take care of me and mine. Um, and I learned how to get respect um, not only from home, but also in the street as well. And I think learning how to get respect from the street allowed me to learn how to actually hustle the system and push the system to actually do what needs to be doing. Absolutely. And... Um... What, um, so it's an interesting sort of journey from Tennessee to Chicago, you know, what, 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 uh, prompted that, that, uh, that journey from Tennessee to Chicago? So I'm originally a a Chicagoan. A lot of people don't really know that. Um, I'm originally from Chicago. I moved from Chicago when I was around 15, 16. I was, uh, in some big mess. Um, I was actually dating a drug dealer then and he got called by the feds uh, <laughs> and i had to move away from chicago mm-hmm. um and i had to really reinvent myself and um figure out who i was and um my parents figuring out who they were as well in my life okay, okay. And- but i moved back yes uh, a good five in six, five or six years ago, um, I moved back here for my with my partner for him. But also, I needed to. I wouldn't have survived if I stayed in Tennessee, and I, I really wanted to be clear with that because because of my intersection as an intelligent black trans woman that is also queer. Um, uh, the South is literally. Um, a hindrance on a lot of our bodies and I really wanted to be able to come back home and actually take what I know and thrive and build it from here build the beacon from Chicago Chicago's always been the beacon for me yes and 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 um, what is that beacon transmitting or saying back to Tennessee? Um, I know I certainly know that there there are there are folks who are are allied with the intersections right in Tennessee, um, and and but I, I definitely you know recognize that they they know themselves to also be in the margins, right? You know, um, but what is the beacon call, uh, calling or telling back to Tennessee? Um. The girls actually, the, the people that I know are just moving on with their lives. I've noticed a lot with, especially black people, we have learned to be content with the violence that surround us in certain ways. Um, and it's also especially the LGBT community too. Um, you've been beaten enough, you get tired of being beaten on, so you do what, what I was told to do, so I won't get beaten on again. And that's the South. Um, in most cases, um, I can, in my narrative, that was pretty much you either are stealth and you, you keep to yourself and you become either, uh, a sex worker or you become, uh, a person that is working little to nothing and still, uh, striving to get something. Um, and it, it's, it's something that I did not want for myself. And but they, they, they say, don't come back. Yes. <laughs> My people are saying, you're doing amazing. Please just don't come back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and so you you arrive here in Chicago. Um, is is Brave Space Alliance is what where where's this sort of that Brave Space in the trajectory when you arrive and then when it when it launches? So it was three three years. That first year, um, I was dealing with a lot of depression. I didn't want to leave the house. Um, I I am I am my mother's baby. I my mother is my anchor. 
and I was dealing with a lot of separating issues and my family is are like a pack of wolves and you know we fight we fuss but two seconds later we like bitch I love you what's good you know what what it is what it is I got a black eye you got a black eye but bitch we hungry we need to go to get this some food um and it, it it's I have never received a uh a type of love that deep until I met my partner um, and understanding that something can grow from it. And he was there paying the bills. He was there while I was down and out until I was able to just really push myself back into community, which I did the second year. Um, the second year, I just wanted to figure out where the trans people were. And the trans people were like, and I'm going to be very visual. Trans people, when I first stepped back in Chicago, were like, we have chains on our ankles and we can't say too much. We know what we want, but if we say what we want, they're going to take the little bit of what we have away from us. Um, and then I started organizing. The year, the end of that year, I started organizing um, Black trans people uh, Benji and so many others to start BTGNC, Black Transgender Not Conforming Collective, where we were giving a few marches and slow speaking, but it, was, it wasn't enough to make enough noise. And I wonder why it wasn't enough to make enough noise, because I figured out that it was a big disconnect with Black and Brown, trans people, and the other LGBT population. So we, I was a part of collect, the collective Trans Liberation Collective, where we centered the lives of trans people um, of all race, um, and then had cis folks uh, surrounding trans people to magnify the voices of transness throughout Chicago. Um, I'm an OG organizer. Um, not only an OG organizer, I, I know the particular type of language is dependent on the person that I'm talking to, and I'm a strategist. Um, that's a core to my heart. I'm always going to be a strategist. Um, I haven't had a few. I only there's only been two or three people in my life that has beat me at chess, um, because of how well I love chess, right? Um, uh, because of that, uh, that's how good I am. But in organizing is you cannot just organize and not have a strategy in your organizing and just not going out there and marching and what is your end goal and my end goal was to build a power back into the trans community in chicago and i think i did that i think i i pushed howard brown to do what they've been doing I've pushed Center of Hostel to do what they are doing. I pushed the, or the LGBT organizations to do what they're doing because they never had a trans person step on their neck. They never had a, a black trans woman say, no, y'all fucked up. And I'm calling y'all all out, even the collectives. I made a big post a few years ago uh, before I did all this. I called uh, BLM out. BLM can tell you I called Asada's Daughters out. I called Let It Breathe out. Y'all say y'all are for black people, but y'all are selective of the black people that y'all are saying liberation for. Not me. That never will be me. Um, before any and everything, when I popped out my mama's cooch, they said, this is a black person. <laughs> and then we can move from gender from there. Um, but I needed people to understand that, bitch, I'm black too. And we need to understand that you won't get liberation and you won't separate liberation from me either. And I think I've been doing that so far. Yes. What is liberation? Liberation is going outside. Ain't got to worry about a goddamn thing. Ain't seen that one motherfucking police officer. I'm walking down the street listening to Nina Simone with 16 black kids and not worrying about someone's going to pull us over thinking we're going to rob somebody. That's liberation. Liberation is equity. Um, liberation is land. Um, liberation is breathing. Um, liberation is um, 
being able to imag- imagine what you want out of life and not having to stress about getting that. That's liberation. And how do we get there? We have to dismantle the bullshit that these white people have put up in place. Dear ancestors, I don't know what. (laughs) They have... It's dismantling a system that is working the way it's supposed to be working. Um, We have to learn how to do it together. Minneapolis have shown us that we can do it together. Minneapolis has shown us black, LGBT, straight, cis, het, um, all creeds of religion are on the ground pushing um, to dismantle a system um, that is not and was not for us. Um, if they can uh, dismantle the police, what else can we do? If they stayed on their neck this long, what else can we get? What else can we get? I've seen a TikTok. I'll be TikToking at nighttime just looking at videos. And it, it was this one particular TikTok of this black girl with two different screens. And she was going back and forth, all America and then the black black people, American and black people. And one of the things that she was like, um, we black people want justice. And America was like, oh, no, we can't give you that. Black people want equity. Oh, no, we can't give you that. Black people are protesting peacefully. All them thugs. And the last one was black people are burning down stuff and popped you upside your head. Oh, we got to give them all. And we have to understand, like, We've done what we've said we've done. Our gen- our mother has done it. Our grandmother has done it. Now, with all of our ancestors feeding our, us the of the, us the work that they've done, but also fed us the education. Fuck that shit. We need to burn this shit down. Uh, my mother's mother is still here, and she still trembles when she sees police officers. She was that woman that was on the marching with other black people and uh, the dogs was attacking her. She still have the dog bites on her legs today, the imprints. So I cannot forget that she did what she did for me to be able to live. So what I have to do is make sure her legacy and her edu- her, edu- her library that she has passed down to me not only collects more books, but also uh, is allowed to other people to read the information and also fight for her information to be freed for other black people to hear or to read or however I'm going to pass it down. But that's the things that we have to do to maneuver. But we can't do that. We won't be able to do that if not all black people come together um, and the different movements of understanding your black ass will not be free unless my black ass is free too. Yes. Yes. Um, so recently in, in co-op for live, um, we were doing a, a closing round and we, um, I posed the question, um, what does it mean to be ungovernable? Um, and that was rooted in an article that we read when we started the group um, called Here's How We Prepare to Become Ungovernable um, in 2017. And so um, I am posing that question to you. Um, what does it mean to you to be ungovernable? Um, and, and, you know, one of the things that, that came out in that session for me personally was just that um, there were several things in me um, that are rooted in, in, in that are there's there's sort of certain oppressions that are rooted in me that shape my behavior and you know one of the things that i was doing was just going in and scrubbing some of that stuff you know just in terms of how i operate in space and meetings and things like that um so i'm i'm, I'm posing to you um how do you see it um, being ungovernable we have to be able to trust each other i think me and my partner had a conversation the other my partner xavier my aunt Ra. He wants me to say his name, make sure his name is being heard. 
I do apologize. His name has just been heard. Um, had, we had a conversation of, we don't want to sit down and hear the whole room. We want to appoint a leader that we throw everything on their shoulders. And it's not, imp- that's not what being in government means. We have to be able to talk to people that are in, that are disabled. We have to be able to have conversations with LGBT people. We have to be able to have conversations with our elders, our mothers, our fathers, our children, and be able to come to a, a census of everybody. Come, and it might take hours. It might take days. But we have to come into a point where we can all have a conversation and be able to trust each other and move forward. This system had did what it did and we don't trust each other. We don't, we don't, we don't have that trust within each other. What I do is I do have trust in the people that I organize with because I know they're crazy, but I also know that they mean me the best. I know that they're problematic when they walk down the street, but I know that they love me when they walk down the street and nothing would happen to me. So I don't have to be in a room fighting for myself. I know Big Tree will fight for me. I know Aislinn will fight for me. I know Stephanie will fight for me. I know Xavier will fight for me. And that's not even a second thought. So we have to understand what that looks like. So not only surrounding ourselves with community that we trust, but surrounding ourselves with a community that will not only we trust, but our comrades in the fight to fight for our freedom and just to live. We have to be able to build that. And that's why I love black people so much, because I love them so much that I have to hit them in the back of their head to understand I'm not here I don't want to sleep with you. I don't want your man. I don't want your mama. I sure in the hell don't want your sister. I got my own shit. But I do want you to be able to live. And I also want you to be able to know how to love. And understand what real love is. Because we don't have that either. We don't know what real love is. We're so close to materialistic shit. We don't have time to figure out, is that real hair? I I love you for your naps. I love you because your feet, I don't love you because your feet stink, but there's some people that will love you because your feet stink. I'm not that person, but there are some people that will. We can have a conversation, but that's not me. I I love you because you wear D.O. That's me. I love you because you wear deodorant. I'm not going to hug you because you don't wear deodorant. You all natural. That's I love you because I will love you all for that. But I love you nonetheless. You get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So we have to be able to be in consistence, uh, insistence with each other and build a community of love and trust. Um, in a moment where we're fighting for liberation and revolting and uh, rebelling um, in a midst of a pandemic, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a multitude of nuances that we will have to be able to push through. It's a multitude of after, I have to trust you that you want to be free right now, but after we get a taste of liberation, now we need to pull you back and talk about your woman hate, your womanizing, and the nuances around violence within the LGBT population within Black people, period. Now we have to do some internalized conversations around violence. And that's a whole conversation by itself. Yes, yes. Um. I'm not loving no big tree said love some musty people. I'm not loving musty people. I love you from the other side of the room. Uh, they two are our siblings. <laughs> <laughs> from the other side of the room. Yes. Yes. Um, so you you took the um I guess, you know, is it a harsh journey towards the MBA? Did did you did you do that? Did you huh? did you pursued an MBA? Yes. Okay. So um, this broadcast was originally, you know, launched because I was very curious about economic conversations that were happening. And I, and, but I, I, they weren't typical, right? Um, 
So I'm sure that, you know, you don't pursue that path without thinking about maybe economy, business, money, you know, uh, quite a bit. So I'm wondering what, um, you know, based upon that training, but then based upon where you are now, what is the economy for? What is it supposed to do? What is it supposed to do? <laughs> uplift whiteness, uplift white supremacy. That's what it's doing now. Oh, you want to be on here too, Ed? <laughs> bring, bring X on in. Come on. <laughs> he, he can talk from the background because he, he loves me in the conversation. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> he loves me in the conversation but it actually what what he said was true it's supposed to give us the things that we need to survive mm -hmm. and not only survive but to thrive um he talks about survival i talk about thriving and it, it's a con it, it's a difference between i am tired of surviving he is too but i am tired of surviving um, we talk about the difference between masculinity and femininity um and what that looks like. The levels of violence looks different. We see receive violence. We, we receive violence, yes, but the level of violence is different. Um, and we have to talk about that and be honest around that, what that looks like. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, we don't have what we need. We've been asking, asking for 450 years, I need bread, water, my house, 40 acres, and a donkey. I didn't get none of that. You told me if you told me if I got a master's degree, I will be okay. You told me that. I got a master's degree, and nigga, I still don't make over forty thousand dollars a year. That's a problem. <laughs> You told me if I act a certain way, I looked a certain way, I wore a pencil skirt, had, I had a pencil skirt, a bob that was straighter than any white woman in the streets. And Gucci glasses and Louis Vuitton heels. I still didn't get what you told me that I was supposed to get. So you know what? I'm going to put these sneakers on, not the Jordans. I'm going to get the Bobos. Because I don't want you to fuck up my shit that I wasted my money on. But I will get the bobos. And I'm going to put this this grease, this cocoa butter on. And then I have to come out here and shit to on fire and fuck you up. Because the understanding is you did not give me what you told me. So you broke the contract of my ancestors. Now my ancestors knocking me on my shoulder and say, bitch, we letting you go. Do what you got to do. This they ha the reckoning has come. Yes. And in terms of the the work that um, Brave Space has been doing, you know, pre COVID, um, you know, post COVID, um, you know, pre uprising, post uprising, um, what sort of what sort of infrastructure do you see yourselves as building? You know, I I know that I I'd, I'd reached out uh, previously. You know, when the when the mutual aid programs are first announced and just kind of threw the head in there, for the ring in the head for a cold and collaborative. But what type of infrastructure do you see yourself building in Brave Space? And to what end even? I don't think um, our infrastructure will ever stop anytime soon. I think it's important that we continue to build. I think it's important that we continue to have different strategies in different ways of something if something pops off. I think people look at me and because <clears throat> because X automatically knows and Mika and uh, Aislinn, they know like I automatically in my mindset is what is the worst outcome if we don't have um, what we already have. And my staff didn't know what was going to happen. Um, but I had to make sure in that moment that I will not, I won't, they won't, uh, be left behind. Um, so it was many different. I have. I call her my handy dandy blue notebook. Uh, she has 121 out ways to turn left or right 
uh, to understand of how are we going to survive just in case? Um, what am I going to do just in case? Uh, what different methods, what what different plans that I can play in place and how can I use my power or my connections that I've made over the years in certain places. Again, I told you I was a strategist. I, I have to make sure um, if all doors are closed, I have a chair at each room that I could bust the window out of and run out that window just in case. Uh, so there has to be a plan, a backup plan to your backup plan to your backup plan. And my backup plan was to make sure now it's time to call the homies. When COVID hit up, and we got to get the food. We got to get the trans relief floor. We don't know how this is going to happen. I know X is connected to farmers. I know Mika is connected to BLM members throughout the nation. I know uh, uh, Aceland is connected to all the leaders here in Chicago. I know, I know all these particular things. I know all these particular things to make sure, just in case, I had to bust you upside your head to go out the other door, but I know my backup plan on that notion. So it was it was a whole like when people turned around like Lasaya's already on the yes because I've been planning for this. I know what this looks like. I know what pandemic actually really means. It don't mean flu. It don't mean a cold. It don't mean oh it's going away. No, a pandemic means. Excuse my language. Bitch, I might just die. That's what pandemic means. Mm -hmm. Not only I might just die, my grandmother, my mother, my partner, my unborn child, all these particular things. So I had no other choice to, but to make sure that my ass was already 20 feet ahead. Yes. Um, so that sparks a question because there's something that I've been sharing um, since the sort of since the onset of COVID. I, I've told folks that basically since I was 20 years old, I've been sort of pre preparing for the end of a world, end of the world in one way or another. Um, early on, that was because I was part of a, basically an apocalyptic religious organization. Um, but that's another that's a longer story. Um, <laughs> but you know, but basically, like the I'm ready for that too. <laughs> There's been this trajectory where, you know, I've been prepared for like, you know, just, I mean, all sorts of, you know, um, things to occur. And so I'm, I'm, I, I'm wondering, um, you know, do you enter a period like that with a sense of calm, a sense of anxiety, a sense of grief? What's the I work in okay. hell. Yes. I work in hell. If the devil was actually real, he would be my best friend. Reasons of such, I, I think trans people is automatically prone to uh, think two to three steps ahead automatically because we automatically face a different type of level of violence anyways when we step outside. So we have to plan and make sure some trans people have to plan five steps. Two o'clock, I know this uh, five o'clock shadow is going to hit. I have to make sure I get a break around two o'clock to go back and fix my makeup. Uh, I have to make sure how I'm going to get home, how I'm going to get to work, um, who I do need to see, who I don't need to see, just it, w where I can use the bathroom, where I can't use the bathroom, what floor I have to go to. We have to plan all that to make sure we don't cause no conflict because if I cause the slightest conflict, I can lose my job just like that faster than anyone else. Faster than any black person, faster than any cis person, faster than any white person. I am always going to be on the chopping block before anybody. Before anyone. And I have to understand what that looks like. We all have to understand that, that, what that looks like as trans people. We are only for most people, are only a consumption piece. You look good enough to fuck, but you're not good, look good enough to love. You're not good enough to love, but you're good enough to give me head. You're good enough to I, for me to come over, lay with you, do what I do with you, and, and leave you in a wet bed. That's, what, that's how the world has placed us. And they continue to place us. So we change. I'm, I'm here to change that. I am not that girl. I have an MBA. I am 33. I'm a grown ass woman. And I dare anyone to tell me anything less. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
And what um, what gives you release? What are, what are your spaces? Um, you, you've noted in the bio, the International House of Prodigy. Uh, I want to hear the backstory on that. Um, but what gives you release from these moments? Um, I sometimes participate in ballroom, um, being around black people. Big Tree is one of them. She get on my, they get on my goddamn nerves. But they are a person that loves you regardless of your flaws. Um, <laughs> Big Tree gets on my goddamn nerves. <laughs> He's lighting up the comment what? section right now. <laughs> I know, I know. But it's, it's something about Big Tree that separates them from everybody else. That when they come into the room, it's just like, oh, shit. But also, because the first thing I know is they're going to jump in the middle of anything. They're going to jump in the middle of anything. Anything that happens. Um, them... My partner, um, my man has not only taught me everything, he has um, brung me back from a deep, dark hole that I put myself in. Um, um, my mother, I'm trying, I, I'm trying to hold back. I cried this morning and I cried heavy this morning um, because it has nothing been nothing but blessings. Um, that has been happening and it feels if it hurts because of these particular type of blessings because we have been internalized like we don't deserve blessings we don't deserve to be okay we don't deserve to be up there with everyone else we deserve to be struggling we deserve to be on the ground continues to fight for our life that's what we deserve but people have fed into me they have loved me. They have catered to me. They have made sure that you, bitch, you is the baddest bitch. You, every time you come in the room, you make sure you drop information and knowledge. You make sure that not only we know what's happening, but everyone around you is okay while you're telling the truth. Um, I am proud that I uh, am, a, am a person in this particular time to have people that only not only cover me but feed me not only with food but with love with conversation um knowledge and they it's not just love it's like it's family I have created family for myself where I did not have family. And I appreciate that. I call them my fam. They're my family because they are they were there when I had nothing. I came here with nothing. Nothing but my brain and a degree. That is all I had. And they accepted it. So it, it's a point of them. That's what I rejoice. That's what I care for. That's what I will always cater to. And that's what that is. Them are who. When I step up, they step up. When they step up, I step up. There's no question. I don't have to question that loyalty. I've never had to question that loyalty when I first started organized with them. Because it was an automatic bitch, no. Bitch, yes. No and yes. <laughs> with these... With, no, the no and yes has come from Mika. Because bitch can never figure out if it's up or down, sideways, or left or right. So... <laughs> It was sending you out text of plays. It's just a, like I appreciate Chicago. 
when I, when I continue to talk about Chicago, I say Chicago is the pinnacle of organizing. Because not only Chicago is the pinnacle of organizing, the people that make up Chicago are realer than any real man, woman I have ever met traveling this world. I'm, I can be walking on the stage with a stain on my dress and no one says nothing in New York. But when I'm in Chicago, the whole front row, bitch, you got a stain on your dress and we don't know why you're on this stage. But that stain, that hoe that told you to come on the stair, on the on the stage with that stain, she needs her ass to be. This, that's Chicago. That's Chicago. That's Chicago in a nuts jail. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, so um, when you think of, um, when you think of the world that, that we are, are, you know, there's, there's a lot, lot of things that were impossible, you know, um, previously that have become much more possible. Uh, you know, certainly, I mean, you know, there's this government policy that's transformed in the face of COVID, you know. Um, there's uh, now, you know, police and prosecutorial policy that's evolving and emerging before our eyes. Um, what, what have we not touched? What, what changes have we not touched upon um, or, or maybe not heard in this moment? What changes? Hmm. Anything that's meaningful or impactful that you know you. you I mean, we ain't touched on shit to be honest. <laughs> I mean, just to be honest, she ain't touched. We ain't touched that fool, that orange man. We ain't touched on shit. We have a mayor that refused to listen to black people. And we have black people that have put a doubt of trust in that white in that in that white woman that's in office right now. Because if you were black, that anti-blackness in you would have been dissipated. They have fully shown shown the anti-blackness in this particular moment that you are not with the people, you are actually the op. And that's how I need to treat you moving forward. So the people are going to stay on the ground. That's what she don't know. People are continue to go to march. That's why BSA is here to make sure the people are fed. That's why BSA is here to make sure the people get water. That's why BSA is here to make sure you get your medical things and all the things in between. And that's the main reason why BSA is partnering with the radical organizers on the ground because we believe in the people. And if you don't believe in the people, you don't believe in nothing. Because me, I believe we will win. It might take a bump or two. It might take a knock or two, but I believe we're going to win. It's going to be a long fight. Oh, it's going to be a long fight. But one thing they did not know is that the people in here in Chicago and the people across the country, people outweigh the police officer 10 to 1 bullet. We just got to learn how to make sure we stand up to the bullets. Are we okay with fighting against a system that has bullets to put us all down. I am okay with that. I am fine with taking a bullet or two to make sure I get that bitch ass out of office. I am okay with that. Now, this is coming from a black trans woman that I can walk outside and catch a bullet. I am okay with taking a bullet or two to make sure that bitch ass is out of the office. Her here or the one in D.C., whichever one it is, they got to go. 2020 is going to be fun when we vote. 2024 is fun, or was it 2023? Whichever one it is, it's going to be fun to get that bitch up out of office. It's going to, I am going to jig all the way down 
from one side of uh, Stony Island to all the way down to the other side. Well, we gonna get this bitch all out of office. We gonna. Get... I am okay with that because we have to understand you're not here for my liberation. You're not here to free black people. You are here to uplift a system to keep us under control. So fuck you, your mama and your daddy too. Um, in Co-op for Lib, we, our study is informed really by, you know, drawing on radical traditions and, you know, um, really understanding the histories of cooperation in black communities. Um, what uh, radical traditions inspire, drive, move you forward, enliven you? Um, what, what are the things that you draw upon and the histories that, that, that you, you, you like to lift up? Say that one more time for me. What are the um, traditions or histories that, that really um, drive you and, lift, and, and that, that you enjoy lifting up? There's only one um, that like literally drives me, my work. Mary Jones was a black trans woman that was a slave. Mary Jones was caught in New York. And I think everyone, everyone knows that I, I speak about this all the time. Mary Jones was caught in New York from stealing $99 from doing sex work from her master. She wanted a, to catch a boat to across seas to get away from slavery. Um, she was later, when she was arrested, she was called a, a man monster because of the way she was dressed. But she, it's in documented in the American history as she is the first black trans woman. And she is the first one that fought this system into the way that the system is fucked up. And I said what I said, and I I dare anyone, I dare anyone to fight me on this one. She said, word for word, she said, I had never had a problem dressing the way that I dress around my people until you told me that is in, inappropriate to dress this way. That tells me right there, them words right there tells me that we had a place with black people. We had a right to live with black people. I had a, a place in black people's hearts. Not only does it connect to her words, but it also connects to history that we were not only teachers, we were nurses, we were priests, we were guardians, we were everything, we were confidants, we were all of that in between, but we rely on what whiteness has told us that we actually are, and that's nothing. I won't, I won't allow you to take my history away from me, away from me. Because I have a place. You told me I don't, but I do. That's what drives me every day when I wake up. That's what drives me to push the resources that I do. That's what drives me to love black people the way I love because I see how colonized we are. I see the chains that still buckle on us. When you talk about, well, Jesus this and Jesus that. Well, I don't know that white man. I don't want to know that white because to me, he sounds like a murderous queen with a heavy hand. I ain't got time for it. It might hurt your feelings, but I ain't got time for it. But that's who drives me. Mary Jones, Mary Jones, Mary motherfucking Jones. Uh, well, you're getting infinite quotes in the comment section from Big Tree. Um, you know, so... Uh, after this, I I'm sure there will be plenty of bylines available uh, on the Ujamaawa <laughs> uh, to be harvested. Um, what action do you want folks to be taking now? You've talked about us making sure that we stay with the streets. We stay, um, we stay in the streets. We stay with the streets. We, we are, you know, uh, in support of those uprisings. What other actions should we be uh, invested in now? The actions we should be investing in right now is not forgetting that I am your sister. I'm you. You're me. And I won't never let you forget it. Even when you try to take my life, I will not let you forget it. 
And once you do, trust me, the Chicago Chicago's going to burn. <laughs> But to let my people know that I am you and you will not forget me on this journey. Because if it wasn't for me and you won't, if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't been able to get as far as you got. But also, you can't be free without me. You won't be free without me. There's, there's no way you can get free without me. Ain't no way in hell. There's no way, no way, no way. You get free without you. You know, I had intended to. Um, I didn't get a chance to to float this in the scene, but I'm gonna see if this audio comes through because um, I was uh, there at the World's Fair in 2018 um, at Experimental Station. And I did catch some very good footage of the recording. I just never got a chance to release um, these pieces. So I'm just going to pull a snippet of this audio and then we'll see. Um, yeah, we'll see how this goes. Okay. Let me. That, that audio was of better quality. So I'm gonna switch back, but um, I will. I'll shoot you that footage just so that you have it. Um, are people still looking or sharing and not acting? Yes. Yes. Yes, they are. Um, my village isn't. My village stands with us. My village fights for me. My village understands the political analysis that all black people means every last stinking wet ass, bad breath, funky feet, non-shaven black person. My village knows that. Now, when you step outside of the village that we have created, that we call Chicago land, yes, they are. Because if you did not, if you was not, you will have been Sharon Tony, the black trans man that got shot in Florida. He got shot because he was identified as a black man, but you won't fight for him because he was the nuance. He was, his intersection was a trans person. Oh no, we don't need to talk about that. We worried about Greg right now. 
And you wonder why some black trans people are like, yo, fuck you. You don't talk about me until it's beneficial to you. You lead a movement where you're, you're, you are one-sided when there's multitudes of people that are happening. You'll share it, but you won't talk about it. Because if you talked about it, Minneapolis would have been on fire because it's just not him that was killed. It was Tony and the 20 other black people that we know that was murdered last year. Why does it have to be a black man that's murdered by the police? Why can't it be a black woman? Because we, we center masculinity as something that needs to be saved. But what we need to be centering black people as a whole is what needs to be saved. Because what if anything COVID has taught us, it don't give a fuck if you're black. I mean, it don't give a fuck if you're a man, woman, trans, tranny, purple, fish. And if you're black, you're going to die. And if you don't have that conversation when you get that mic in your hand, I don't want to fuck with you. Because you don't see me, like I told you earlier, like I told in the conversation earlier, you don't see me until it's after 12 o'clock and you need your dick sucked. You'll see me and you'll call me then. Mm-mm. Your words don't mean shit. Your shares don't mean shit if you ain't out there talking the talk that you're supposed to be walking. It don't mean shit to me. All right. Resonate. Resonate. Um, There's been all that said. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Big Tree is correcting internal internal language and, and external language we appreciate that um what do you want to leave folks with before we go i love you <laughs> after that yes <laughs> it's called stern love absolutely that's exactly that's exactly what it's called and we need that i love you Sometimes love look like hitting your ass upside the head with a bat. Because I've done everything that I said I would do nicely. I wrote it on a stamp. I wrote it on the wall in my own blood. I shaved my hair. I cut off a limb. I done all them things, but that wasn't enough. Now I have to cuss. I have to beat you upside your head. Put your finger on your own iPhone to open the iPhone. Make you speak and say, liberate trans people. I shouldn't have to do all that. I shouldn't, I am not the op. I'm not that. That's not me. But I love you. I will always love you because there's one thing that you can erase. There's one thing that you can never take from me. There's one thing that you you can never disconnect yourself from me. That melanin bitch, you can never take that away. When you look at me, you see yourself. That's one thing you will never be able to take away. The Thayer Wade, loving us radically to the root, sternly. Director of Brave Space Alliance. Brave Space Alliance has been showing up in this world, showing up in this work, um, taking care of us all. Thoroughly, deeply, richly, abundantly. And is asking us, show up. Show up. Yes, um, reminds me, yeah, I had a friend, 
That was that was their phrase. I, I still have a friend. <laughs> That's their phrase. Show up. <laughs> Anytime you in the room and you know you're there but you're not there, show up. Yes. We see you, we receive you. This is uh, the Ujima Awa. I'll offer the most brief uh, recap for folks. Uh, oh, and you know, I did not mean to click my other camera off. And boom. Yes, this has been the uh, that segment of the Ujima Awa. I just want folks to know cooperation, collaboration. As I mentioned, uh, this Sunday we will be um, back in session three to six um, on the uh, on the Zoom line. Uh, so if folks, you know, are interested in understanding and, and digging into the uh, radical tradition of cooperation in black communities, be there. Uh, we will be um, engaging ideally in some some pieces um, um, on Ida B. Wells uh, work here in Chicago um, around the Negro Fellowship League, as well as uh, some segments on I've Got the Light of Freedom. As we dig into some of our more develop, more of our development timeline and our work here at Cooperation for Liberation, so be sure to check out the Cooperation for Liberation uh, Facebook page uh, for that event time and and for the link to that Zoom. Uh, otherwise, we are going to be uh, closing up shop and make sure that you check out Brave Space Alliance's uh, website. Um, would that be bravespacealliance.org? Yes, bravespacealliance.org. <clears throat> Um, yeah, every everything that you need to know is on there from COVID to now to a few years ago. Yes. So be sure to visit BraveSpaceAlliance.org. Um, learn about their mutual aid programs. If you have, if you don't know about them, you know, you must have been under a rock or something. I mean, you know, they're doing work, right? <laughs> you know, especially if you're on the South Side. Um, and so, yes, uh, dig into Brave Space Alliance. Um, be there, be alongside, uh, be in the streets. Be with the folks who, uh, who are loving us radically, um, even as they challenge us and, and challenge convention. Um, and that is necessary. And until then, folks, this has been this segment of the Ujima Hour. I want to just uh, highlight uh, a bit. Um, so uh, next month, uh, we'll be speaking with Elizabeth Carter, uh, formerly of Urban Cooperative uh, Enterprise Legal Center. Uh, so we'll be talking with Elizabeth Carter about uh, some, some of that legal work that's happening around cooperatives um, that she was doing previously in New Jersey and now is doing um, in Chicago and nationally. Uh, and so we look forward to seeing you back here for another uh, segment of Movement Monday. Um, and until then, I will bid you peace. Thank you very much, Lasaya, for, for being on the line with us. No problem. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> All right. And we are out.